Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Spring 2021 BSB Bookathon. We're yeah. excited to have you join us. Oh, did I interrupt somebody? No, no? I said, okay, good. That was just me. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so glad everyone is here. If you're watching this on Zoom, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are, uh, we are also recording this, but will be available later. But if you're watching live, make sure that you switch to gallery view in order to see all the speakers on the screen. So this is a panel on the writer's journey. I'm really excited to have a great conversation today with our wonderful panelists. My name is Nell Stark and I am a Bold Strokes Books author as well, but for today I will be your moderator. And what I've asked our panelists to do first is to um, find three or fewer words to describe their relationship to writing. So what I'm gonna do is I'll introduce each in turn and ask them to share their words. And if their words are especially intriguing, maybe a little bit of you know, why they chose those particular words. So we're gonna go in alphabetical order, last name. We'll start with the great Georgia Beers, who is a writer of romance, a sipper of wine, and a lover of animals, and her animals may be making an appearance today. <laughs> Proud of her introvert status, she's surprised to admit that she is over this isolation and wants to visit, talk to, and hug people again. I'm oh, sure no. we can all relate. <laughs> Despite being in quarantine, she managed to finish her 30th women loving women romance novel. That's amazing. She also bought a house and began a love affair with a little black dog named Archie, whom we all just got to see, and you may get to see as well, who has saved her heart. So Georgia, what words did you choose to describe your relationship with writing? My relationship to writing is mentally unbalanced. <laughs> mentally unbalanced, that's yes. a good one. So would you like to share more? Just because it ebbs and flows. Some days I will sit down and crank out a whole bunch of words, and other days I'm trying to decide whether I should just watch some Netflix instead. Um, it really does come and go. I have a pretty good handle on it after this many books, but I also know that this is what happens and to ride it out. And some days I just do watch Netflix because it's just not there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. Time. I'm really glad you shared that because it's important for people to know that, right? Especially those of you who are aspiring published authors, you know, it's not like you can always turn it on. And, and for most people, it is that curve that you described. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty well, good at you. turning it on, but still. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's great. Um, all right, we're gonna move to Leslie. So um, Leslie Davis lives in the UK where her time is spent gaming and pursuing endless forms of geekery, woohoo. <laughs> when she puts the game controller down, she can be found writing stories of many genres, but always with romance at its heart, and we love that. Um, Leslie, what words did you choose? I chose love, achievement, and squirrel. And squirrel? Squirrel, yep. <laughs> That's, would you like to elaborate? I will. Uh, uh, love, I love what I do. I love getting all the characters together and putting them on the page. Um, Achievement is I have um, ME, which is like a chronic fatigue illness, and it has a habit of taking away my concentration and my memory, and I sleep a lot. I kind of hibernate. Um, so for me, every line I write is an achievement. And Squirrel is because of the fatigue and brain fog. Um, on the days that I do get up and go, yes, today I'm going to write, by the time I've got the laptop set up and the paper all set, um, my head goes, no, no, we're going to do gaming instead. Yep. So I'm easily distracted. Yep, I think a lot of us can relate, but, but what a wonderful achievement too. Thank you for sharing that with us because it's, you know, it, it's really remarkable. So Thank you. we appreciate that. Um, all right, we're moving on to Sam. So Sam Liddell grew up in the DFW Metroplex. She has four books published with BSB and is currently working on her next project, a historical romance. I'm excited to hear more about that later in our session. Sam, what words did you choose? So since we had a word limit, I decided to use as many syllables as possible <laughs> and go with ideally constantly evolving as my writing that. process. That's fantastic. Would you like to elaborate at all? Um, sure. Uh, just that I, I want to constantly better myself and, and learn from, from my fellow BSB writers and all the, all the writers out there. So hopefully always improving, um, in any way that I can with my writing. That's fantastic. That's a great mission statement. I love that. And you know, there's no way to improve like doing it. That's, that's the, that's the best way. So, um, fantastic. And now we're moving to Lee Lynch. Uh, Lee's most recent novel is Accidental Desperados, the second in the Rainbow Gap lesbian family saga. 
the recipient of a number of awards, Lee has been publishing lesbian stories since the late 1960s, including The Swashbuckler and her long running column, The Amazon Trail. And I just have to say, it is just always an honor to be uh, you know, on a panel with Lee in Lee's presence. She's amazing. Her camera isn't working today, so you won't be able to see her, but you'll be able to hear her. And we are so appreciative of everything that you have contributed, Lee. And I'd love to hear what your three words are because you have had a tremendous writer's journey and it, and it isn't over yet. Thanks, Nell. Uh, I'm glad I don't have the camera because I'd be blushing. <clears throat> um, my three words are literature, lesbians, and love. Oh, I love that. Do you want to say more at all? I, it, it, uh, it's kind of like uh, chronological. Um, the, the literature came first uh, when I was 14. The lesbians came second when I was 15. And the love came last when I met Laney. Met Laney. <laughs> but that's basically what, what I write about. That's basically my life. Yeah. Well said, thank you for that, that's beautiful. And last but certainly not least, we have Morgan and uh, we've got one of her cats as well. So Morgan lives in Washington, DC with her two feline children. Uh, is it Milo or Milo? Which Milo. Milo, thank Milo. you. And Elsa, is, which one is, is Milo? Hi Milo. Milo, it's great to see you as well. <laughs> During the day, she works for an international animal, animal welfare nonprofit. And at night, she's powering through her next novel and trying to defeat procrastination, which we've already heard a little bit about. Morgan, what words did you choose? I chose rewarding, challenge, challenging, and necessary. Cool. Uh, do you want to say more? I chose necessary because I have no idea what to do when I'm not writing. I am winding down with the next book, and now I have all this time, and I don't know. I thought I was going to be really excited to finish it, and now I have this free time, and I have to do something. So I'm working on the next one. Um, challenging, just you know, Sam was saying how she's always wanting to grow. And I think that's part of it, growing, learning, listening to other uh, writers and readers and rewarding because you have people reading your stories and when they reach out to you saying that the story like really impacted them, that there's nothing more rewarding than that. Yeah, it's the best feeling. Um, thank you for yeah. that. Um, necessary is, is a, a, an important <laughs> word for me as well. So. I'm going to turn to our, our next question, and you all had this ahead of time, so I'm excited to sort of hear the answer here. Um, if your writer's journey were turned into a film, what would the major plot beats be? So what, in other words, are the major sort of moments in your journey as a writer? Um, and of course, if you would like to, to cast yourself in this film um, or your love interest, you're welcome to do so as well. But we're gonna, we're gonna start with you, Morgan. What, what, what would the major plot beats be of this, this film of your writer's journey? Okay, major plot points. Well, the inciting incident would be me knowing that this is going to be my next book. I'm excited. I'm spending all the hours, even during work, writing the story. The midpoint, I'm proposing it to Sandy. She says, okay. And that instant writer's block and procrastination until the deadline. <laughs> it's like a week before and I'm trying to crank out those last words and trying to defeat insecurity, self-doubt, um, and the deadline. That's fantastic. It's a it's a very fast paced tale at the end there, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. And just for every, anybody who doesn't know, Sandy, Sandy Lowe is the senior editor at Bold Strokes Books. And so part of the process for, for us as authors is to send her a proposal of what, you know, what we're going to do next. And that happens once you are already a signed author. If you haven't yet signed with Bold Strokes Books or with another company, then the process is different. And we can always talk about that if people have questions about getting started on the writer's journey or on the published author's journey. Um, so Lee, I'm going to turn this question to you. What are the major plot points in your, in your writer's journey? Again, it's kind of chronological and, and I have to look up what a plot beat was. I'm still not quite clear on that, but. Um, yeah, just the major, the major plot points. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I don't work with plot, plot points. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. But so my character would would again come out in her early teens, and and she'd have the morals of a rabbit. She'd have to connect with Barbara Greer at the ladder. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and start writing. And, and, then, and then lesbian feminism would have to come along. And I guess the next step, it, it, you know, what I'm doing is going through lesbian literature because that is my life. Uh, the next step was uh, lesbian feminism activism and, and the creation of Nyad Press. Again, that Barbara Greer connection because how would I write books without Nyad Press coming along when it, when it did? Um, and then, you know, there don't have to be a lot of heartaches in, in writing struggle. And, and, and then, you know, enter Radcliffe <laughs> and VSD. Uh, kind of renewing uh, and enlarging lesbian literature. So it, it would be a literary journey for sure. That's wonderful. And, you know, it's, it's so incredible to hear your journey because, you know, it's the journey of, you know, of all of us in certain ways and a journey that not everybody knows. There are so many ways to get your stories out now but when yeah. you started, there was really only the latter, right? That was really the only option? That was the only option. Yeah. If, and, if you wanted to write about lesbians. Yeah. Which is all and, I wanted to do. <laughs> of course. And we're glad you did. I mean, your, your voice has been so important. And now to see in your own lifetime, throughout your own journey, the proliferation of, of options. Yeah, how, does that, looking, how does that feel to you? I'm looking at this panel. You know, would you guys be there? Have been there? Have you got, would have, you, you have come the same way without these incredible people who created presses and, and magazines. Yeah. Thank you yeah. all for picking us up on it and continuing the work. Yeah, we, we, we stand on, on your shoulders and, and, and others and it's, uh, it's something really important to remember. So thank you. Sam, yeah. how about you? Yeah, so I was just thinking of how grateful and humbled I am by everybody who came before. So thank you to everybody. <laughs> um, but in terms of <laughs> the, the movie version of my, my writing journey, um, I don't know, it would probably include a few things like going to college for a degree in creative writing, um, thinking that that would, you know, kickstart things right away <laughs> immediately after and then realizing it was really more of a foundation for, um, you know, getting started um, and would probably be intertwined with um, my own coming out because I didn't come out until late in college. So I think that own, um, that aspect of not being completely comfortable with myself yet was holding me back as a writer. I wasn't willing to write what I really wanted to um, at that point. So I actually ended up uh, moving abroad for a couple of years. And so I guess the film would, would go to South America. <laughs> and that kind of gave me the, the space I needed to kind of shed the expectations I was holding on to for myself to, um, to be able to put a story together that I wanted to, which ended up being Rocks and Stars, my first book with BSB. So um, yeah, it would just be, you know, something like that. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I, I love what you said about the foundation that you got from, from being able to study, um, you know, that investment that you make when you're studying something in, in your own craft, that's really important. Um, and I can empathize with the, the not coming out so late in college part. Uh, that, that, was, that was me as well. So our movies would look similar in that way. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to move to Leslie now. Leslie, how about you? Okay, this question really, really stumped me. <laughs> I really had to think. I'm sorry. Okay, what the heck can I do? So um, I'm going to go the Disney route. So imagine the castle and the Tinkerbell pixie dust um, to start the movie off. Uh, your leading lady uh, has been under a curse for 10 years, having to sleep. When she wakes up, she's got all these stories in her head and needs to have them go somewhere. She's led by the spirit of a wolf, um, the late Chris Ann Wolf, God bless her, whose um, publish, uh, publishing company I was in touch with, um, fangirling over her writing. They said, do you know anybody that's writing? I was going, me? <laughs> so my first book went straight to a publisher and like all good Disney films, it was accepted straight away. Thank goodness. Um, I wrote with them for five years, five books. Um, but 
sometimes, you know, Disney films, they want a bit more magic. And then this marvelous, great sorceress appeared who said, I have this amazing castle, big publishing castle. Would you like to come and join it? And I was like, hell yes. So I joined up with, with BSB and 10 books later, I'm still there, which is an absolute blessing. And I was linked with an amazing uh, editing witch who only has to try and hex me twice over my overuse of adjectives. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is not a, a happy ending. This is a to be continued. Yep. Yep. Wonderful. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful extended metaphor there. That was fantastic. Um, and, and I'm guessing that the, the amazing sorceress would be Radcliffe. Is that, is that right? I think so, yes. <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> or Len Burrow, technically. Um, excellent. So, Georgia, yeah. how about you? What's your film? I, too, had trouble with this question, I just want to say. <laughs> um, mine starts off with this poor, uninformed little teenager writing short stories um, about heterosexual couples, because that's what she was supposed to do. Um, very much like Sam and you, it was late college before I was like, oh, that's what's going on here. Okay. So kind of coming into her own, um, starts with the dare, where I read a book I read a romance. Um, it was awful. And I remember being furious when I finished it and I threw it down. And I said to my partner at the time, I could do a better job than that. And my partner said, well, what's the difference between you and that author? And I said, she wrote a book. <laughs> she was like, yeah, yeah, that's the difference. So I took that dare and I wrote um, Turning the Page and I attempted to send it to a publisher who also like Leslie accepted it right away. Um, and that was the beginning of a trajectory that kept going up. I'm gonna call it a little bit of lady luck. Uh, learn, grow, learn, grow, grabbing the hands above me that helped me, the Karen Callmakers and the Catherine Forrests and the Lee Lynches. And then I think the, maybe, I don't even know if I would call it the climax of the story, but it could be where I finally get to a point where now I'm reaching down to help the newbies come up and stand next to me. Um, so it's kind of a really cool feeling, kind of a coming for a full circle kind of thing. And I would like to request that Sandra Bullock play me in my movie, please. Oh, I love that. I think that must happen. Absolutely. I think so too. Absolutely. I think so too. Yes. That's a clear, it's a clear winner. I mean, you and Sandra are dead ringers. <laughs> We're like sisters. We're like this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not the only one who thinks so. Chat, you can, you can, you know, let me, let us know that you agree <laughs> with, with George's casting call. Um, uh, any other casting calls that you'd like to make anybody else or in the chat, feel free to cast your, your panel here if you'd like to cast them. Um, great. Well, it was, it was so fun. Thank you for answering that question, even though it may have been a tricky one. We have some great questions from our, our viewers. So the first is from Renee um, asking, do you write chronologically in order of the events of the story, or do you write a scene out of sequence to what calls you in the moment? So are you writing linearly or non-linearly? Um, let's start with Leslie. Do you, do you write linearly or non-linearly? Um, pretty much. That's a really hard word to have to say. It is. Don't say it. I almost <laughs> messed it up just now. Thank you. <laughs> Chronologically uh, right, is easier. Chronologically, yeah. All right. Um, but I do have sometimes scenes that I've sat down and gone, oh, that actually is something that I want to put in. So that gets put in halfway through while I'm doing it. But it is normally from, as, I, as my head does it, I go from left to right. I go chapter at a time. But I, but I will scroll bits down. That's great. Thank you for that. that. You know, everybody does it differently. And some people really have to write chronologically. There's sort of no other way to, to do it. Um, and I see that Lee, we can see Lee now, which is really exciting. Hello, everybody. Um, and if you just wouldn't mind putting yourself on mute while you're getting things straightened out, that would be lovely. Uh, Morgan, how about you? Do you write chronologically or no? So I used to. And then when I went to college, one of the best pieces pieces of advice was that we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to write chronologically and it blew my mind. I paid good tuition dollars for that. So once I learned that I wrote the scenes that I wanted to, because a lot of times I would 
feel like I had to write in that order and I would hit a roadblock and then I just wouldn't finish the story. So now I just write scene by scene. And I think that's why my stories are so much longer because once the scenes are written, I have to go back and tie in the transitions and it ends up being like 90,000 words. But um, yeah, that was my best piece of advice. And I don't write chronologically. That's fantastic. So it was a learning experience for you. So, so Morgan described this great process of, you know, starting off writing chronologically, thinking that's the only way how, and then, you know, learning in college that, that it doesn't have to be that way. And that was liberating for you, it sounds like. That's really cool. Um, Georgia, how about you? My OCD gets really worked up if I don't write chronologically. I've tried. It gives me agita. <laughs> and when people talk about writing this scene and that scene, Morgan, that would drive me crazy. I, more power to you because I cannot do it. The closest I can get to that is if I'm writing and this most often happens with the love scene, I'm just not feeling it. I can skip that and then come back to it, but I can't, that's as close as I can get to writing out of order. I have to go from page one to the end, push all the way through, and then I go back to the beginning and then I will pepper things in and tweak and polish and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I have to go in order or it messes with me. Yeah. Hey, that's how it is. That's okay. You've written 30 books. It's working, it's true. right? Like it's, it's working. Really working. <laughs> um, Sam, what, what's your method? Um, it's varied so far. So my, my fantasy trilogy, I had to write everything in order because there were so many things going on throughout all three books. I just had to do that in order to know what was going on. But um, for Rocks and Stars, actually, Georgia, you may want to tune out. I <laughs> had to write la, 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 la. <laughs> one scene popped into my head first and it ended up being one of the last scenes in the book. And then I just was probably like one of those scenes from a movie where there's papers taped everywhere on the walls and scenes everywhere. It was completely out of order. And then I, I went back and kind of pieced everything together that way. So that was that was different for me, but it worked for that book. So just kind I'm of so jealous that you can do that. I so envy that ability. I just I can't. It's okay. It's okay. Everybody does it their own way. That's there's not one way. And I love that our viewers are seeing that, right? There isn't yep. one right way yep. to write a book, but writing the book is always the right way. You know, however you get that done, that's, that's the way. Lee, how about you? What, what's your process like? Well, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to be writing, but in my head, I have to follow the characters and the characters are living their lives chronologically. Um, but a character may do something, I don't know, threaten to commit suicide, for example, in chapter one, and, and then by chapter 17, that's all wrong. That's all wrong. Um, so she threatens to commit suicide or whatever in chapter 17, because it makes the story flow better. Is that is that answering your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah. The, yeah. The main point being that just write, just let let it come, and then later on you'll see what belongs where. And I, and I learned that from Catherine Forrest, who, who who took one of my books and said, "Oh, this chapter needs to go there." Oh, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the role of the editor uh, is something we can talk more about if people are curious, but, but yes, you know, your editor can sometimes see something like that uh, where you can't, which is, which is really, um, really important. And, and the hard work of writing, I think a lot of us would agree is, is in revision. You know, there's a lot, a lot, a lot that happens in revision. Um, so we've got some just wonderful questions from our audience. Um, Anne is wondering um, if you didn't study creative writing or a related subject at a university, how did you learn to write? So I know that Sam studied creative writing. Um, did anybody else study creative writing? Because I'm going to skip you. So Morgan studied. So we're going to skip Sam and Morgan on this one. Um, Leslie, how did you how did you learn to write? Um, well, back in my time at school, when we still had stone tablets and the chisels, <laughs> um, it wasn't it wasn't what I'm how I'm writing now. Um, my editor Cindy Creesap is teaching me so much more that I'm looking at it and going, I don't know what the hell that is. Um, but I literally, it, it didn't help that my ME took away my writing ability. Literally, it took away um, me even being able to hold a pen and scribble. 
Um, so when I was able to function from the worst time of that, I had to pretty much start start over. And I just I just wanted to write. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to write. Um, so I read a lot and tried to pack in as much as I could and see what, how other authors wrote and then picked up my own style. But I've been really blessed with editors because they're, they're, they, they help so much. So it sounds like for you, a lot of the learning has come through that editorial process. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, how about you, Georgia? I think that, um, you know, some people are just, prone to different things like math makes me want to cry and hurl myself off a balcony. Um, yeah, numbers are not my thing. Words are my thing and they always have been. And that I find so interesting. My mother has old report cards of mine from like second grade where one of them says, Georgia likes to tell stories and Georgia spells above her grade level, which I love <laughs> because I'm just, I've always been a words girl. It's very rare for me to spell something incorrectly. It always has been but I can't balance my checkbook to save my life. So I just think that some people are prone to words and some people like I am words and art and that kind of thing. And some people are math and science and I, that go away, not for me. Um, somebody else take care of the science of the world. I'll come, I'll be over here writing. I'll be, I'll write your speech for you, but you do mm -hmm. the formulas and stuff. Um, I read all the time. I think reading is a huge way to learn how to write. I mean, they, they say that if you want to write in a certain genre, you should read in that genre. Um, so I've, you know, I spent a lot of my childhood in the library. Um, and I wrote fan fiction when that started to become a thing. And I think that that was a good way to kind of hone the craft because there are uh, fan fiction pitfalls that, you know, if you started in fan fiction, you know, some of the fan fictionisms that your poor editor was like, oh, God. <laughs> Um, yeah, but then, but you can learn other things. I found fan fiction to be a great way to learn how to focus on things other than character, because when you're writing fan fiction, those characters are already, you already know them. You don't have to, and everybody who's reading you already knows them, but they don't know your setting or your, you, you know, whatever the mystery is or whatever other stuff you're writing. So it was a good way to learn how to focus on that other stuff. Um, so I just, I think, I think that I just was prone to it, I guess, if it's kind of a weak answer but no it's no have. it's a wonderful answer I mean so you're talking about natural aptitude right yeah. which is you know, the... I, was a, I was a communications major I majored in broadcasting and journalism and theater so you know as far away from math as I could get no math <laughs> but but yeah you know you're talking about this wonderful blend of natural aptitude and yeah. then immersing yourself in literature right and by literature I mean whatever it is you want to write your reading yes. which you talked about the importance of that and yeah. then practicing and I agree with you I think fan fiction is a wonderful way to practice mm -hmm. um and yeah. to understand your audience and to yes. you know get some good dialogue I mean that's just great all of that is really important um Lee how about you um there was never any question I mean I, I, you know little kids are supposed to be fire fire people when they grow up or something but I just <laughs> wanted to read and write um, and, and I started reading the New Yorker magazine really early because I worked there and that has definitely mm, um, affected at least my nonfiction writing. Uh, I was saying as, as George said, reading, reading the classics and really being absorbed in the classics. My first adult book was Victor Hugo's uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame which my, my brother gave me and I was fairly lost, but the beauty of it, the depth, the, uh, I just want to, want to emulate that. So for me, I started writing poetry and, and the teachers went nuts. And so I was encouraged to keep, that was another thing, teachers encouraging you and recognizing you had the kind of aptitude again. Georgia talked about. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. There was never a choice. It just that was who I was. Yeah, and and to to pick up on Morgan's word of necessary, word, right? Necessary sounds like right? that's a part of a lot of our journeys. Uh, so Eric and Kim's question. I'm going to combine these two. So 
Um, Eric specifically wanted to know about proposals and Kim was asking about from inception through publication, how long does it take to get a manuscript written, reviewed, approved and printed? So I wonder if we can combine those questions and just talk about the process now. So you're all established authors in Bold Strokes books, right? So you started at some point, whether it was with BSB or another company and or you self-published, right? And you, you got to start and then now you're here. What is your process now for creating a new novel and how long does that generally take you? Um, Morgan, let's start with you. It takes a long time. I'm easily distracted. So like my first book, I think that was like two years. The second book was maybe two years. Um, I think I need to rethink my whole strategy because once I propose it to Sandy and it's approved, I seem to lose all motivation to write it. And then I work on the next one. So I might do... I, now I think, now I have an idea brewing right now. I think I'm going to write maybe at least half of it or like three fourths of it before I propose just because I, I don't know what happens. My brain stopped working and I don't want to do a crunch time again. It's really stressful. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, and, and you know, that process can change over time, right? You know, you started doing it one way and, and try another way and, and we'll see. But that's great. So about two years, you said for you, roughly. Yeah, I, I want to be one of those people who can write a book in six months. I think that's amazing. And maybe one day I'll get there. Well, we're, we're going to talk to some of those people in just a minute. So we'll see what they, what advice they can give you. Um, uh, let's go to Leslie. How about you? What, you know, you're going to write a new book. What's your process and how long does it take you? Um, I try to do the whole writing in about nine months. I always class it as my baby. Nine months of doing it. Um, it depends what game is out at the time because Call of Duty will take a lot of my time away. <laughs> um, and I have perfected the art of writing in between games where I will literally put the controller down, scribble, and then as soon as I hear the music that it's saying, pick your damn gun up, I'm back up and ready again. Um, <laughs> Which is, really, which is really sad, but I have wrote books by doing that. Um, I try to put in the proposal when I have at least half of it done, because the minute I put in the proposal, my body goes, and we're sleepy now. And my Emmy knocks me out. It does it every darn time. It's almost like it knows, it knows, no, you're going to have a deadline and we're not going to make it easy for you. So I try to get as much done as possible so that I have maybe like the last quarter so I can go, okay, I've only got this bit to do, but it's the fun of it. So you write, you write a fair amount before you send in a proposal. Is that, is that what you're saying? I try to, okay. yes, okay. because otherwise, the same as Morgan, my, my head just goes, I really don't want to do this right now. There's so many other things. Squirrel. It's like <laughs> <laughs> to come back to our words, squirrel. Yep. Yes, yep. Yeah. every time. Great, Sam. How about you? What's your process like for a new book? Yeah, this is a good question. I'm trying to. I'm kind of reflecting on everything. I at the beginning was a person who had written the, a majority of my book before I'd proposed it um, with my first one, and then with the trilogy. Um, so the turnaround time between all of that and the finished product was fairly quick. I think the quickest was with the second book in the trilogy, Broken Rain. I wrote that in, I think about six months, which was the fastest I'd ever done anything and haven't done it since, but um, that was exciting. And um, then I think, I think I'm usually around like the, the nine months to a year with, with everything is where I generally fall. Uh, like Maureen was saying, I wanna be one of those people who can kind of start trending them out, but not there yet. So we'll get there. Hey, that's great, though. I mean, nine months to a year, a book a year is still really impressive. A book is really impressive. Let's be honest here, right? Um, but we're about to talk to somebody who does a bunch of books a year. So Georgia, tell us how you do it. Well, I mean, it has a lot to do with the fact that I write full time now. I don't have another day job that takes up eight hours of my day. So that's a big factor right there. Um, I write three books a year. So basically, in four months, I send in my idea, I get it approved. The blurb, honest to God, the blurb is the worst part. I would rather write seven books and no blurbs than write seven blurbs and no books. I swear to God, I hate the blurb. It is the, my nemesis. It is the bane of my existence. And 
I try to pretend that I don't know about it. And then I get my email from Sandy. That's like, I need your blurb, like by the end of next week. And then I'm ready to, again, hurl myself off a balcony. Um, so I just, that, so, so four months, I think. And I, is it, so it's proposal, acceptance, blurb, and then write. And usually um, I have the beginning, the climax and the end in my head. And then I just have to piece the rest together and it, and it flows along as we go. So that's, that's my process. And I do that three times a year. It's amazing. It's amazing, but, but I, 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 I hear don't, you. I don't take any time off between them and I need to start doing that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Please do because we don't want you to burn out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we need your amazing stories. We need everybody's amazing yep. stories. Lee, how about you? What's, what is your process like when you're ready to write a new novel? How long does that take you? That take you? Years. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, it takes years. I, I get an idea or even a title, and I write some other books that are whatever. And and my mind just keeps working. Um, and so my note cards are everywhere. I mean, they're just spread everywhere. And I, every once in a while, I have to organize them. This book. This book. This book. Right now, I'm. Um, I, I signed a contract for four years um, because it takes me four years at least. Uh, it has taken as long as eight years um, for the next in the, in the series of books I'm reading. I'm writing, um, and but then I had this idea that I had to revise all my short stories, my early short stories, and and uh, try to get them published as a classic short stories. So now I have to revise them and that's very time consuming. And, and the novel, which is called Magnificent Disturbance is kind of, you know, off in a corner and I'm worrying, can I do it in four years? And I keep promising myself I will not do another book while I'm writing a novel. <laughs> <laughs> How's that working out for you? Not so good. <laughs> I, I, it leaves me so exhausted. I know how you feel, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, there we go. There, perfect. Um, so, so I want to uh, talk now a little bit about the relationship that you have with your editor because we have a question uh, in the chat about that, and, and the question is about you know. How much choice do you have? How does it work if you if you if you don't click well with your editor? But I really want the question to be a little broader than that. And, and tell us how your how editing works for you. If you want to to talk about any of the the specifics there, that's fine. But what is it? What do you gain from it? What's hard about it? Um, any anything that you want to say about your editing process, Morgan? Do you do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, I'm currently thinking, but I, I can I can think out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um I just listen to whatever my editor says she has more wisdom and experience than I do so whatever she brings to the table I'll accept um I mean I do get nervous just because it's your baby and you want something to work out there was one story I had this one scene and I was so proud of it like oh my gosh this is so cute it had something to do with French so like it wasn't really necessary but it added to cuteness and she was like no we're gonna take all this out like no no Ouch. um but I know now I mean it's it was for the best you don't need French words in the story um what else left to say I, th I think that's it I, I listen to my editor um if I don't think something works in the story I kind of just give it to her and then see if she says anything. Um, and if not, I'm like, okay, I think that's good. We'll see. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, that helps a lot. Thank you. Georgia, how about you? I think that it's really presumptuous to assume that you can't learn anymore. So I trust my editor to keep teaching me and I do keep learning things. Um, when you've been doing this as long as I have, you kind of get the hang of it. And I think I turn in pretty clean manuscripts at this point, but there's never an instance where at some point during editing, I don't go, oh, okay, now I get that. You know, there's always something that I'm learning. So um, I, my editor is Ruth Sternglance and we will 
Skype with each other and we'll talk it out and I can brainstorm with her. And I don't really do that very often. I don't need to brainstorm. I don't have beta readers. I kind of know what I'm doing and nobody sees what I'm doing until Ruth gets it. Um, but I also know that if I get stuck, I can call her up and be like, all right, here's where I am. I'm not sure which way this should go. And she will help me talk it through until it feels right. Um, but that's my my biggest takeaway from editing at this point in my career is that I'm still learning. And, and you know, this is, again, audience, this is someone with 30 published books. So, <laughs> so take, take note, you're always gonna keep learning. You always know, you learn. never learned everything. Yeah. I don't think yeah. we ever plateau in this, in this craft. I think it's, there's always something that we can be enlightened by. You're here. Um, actually, I love that you mentioned beta readers. Um, I'm going to go back to Morgan for a second. Do you have beta readers, Morgan? Do you use beta readers? I use a few people, um, other writers, um, maybe friends who have learned to give me their honest feedback. And now they have kind of perfected and now they really like giving me the honest feedback that kind of bruises the ego but that's always good to have um but I would like to use more beta readers I think it would just it's beneficial and like Georgia I'm like con I'm constantly learning just from editors but also from readers and what works and what doesn't work yeah great thank you I, you know some people um love having beta readers in many different kinds uh, other people don't. Um, and so I think this is a really useful part of the, the editorial process. It's sort of like a pre-editing process mm -hmm. because a beta reader, for those of you who may not know, is not an editor. It's a friend or a, uh, somebody, who has somebody, it can be anybody, whom you ask to read your book while you're writing it usually or just after you've written it. And the kind of feedback you're looking for from them is more aligned with what the audience is going to give you than the editor who is really trying to work on your craft. And it's not that a beta reader can't give you information about your craft, but they're more reacting, right? The way that your readers eventually will. Would you all say that's pretty fair? If you, yes. if you have a distinction, you can obviously let me know. Sam, what, what about you? What's your editing or beta reading process like? I... I've used like a friend or a significant other in the past to, to read over some of my things, but otherwise I don't really use anybody. Um, my editor is usually the one who kind of sees everything once it's really ready to go. Um, and I love my editor. <laughs> um, my editor is Barbara and I think she's great. Um, we have a good working relationship and, um, and I echo what Morgan and Georgia have said with just trusting them and learning, learning from from them constantly. And um, I am somebody who uses a lot of words to say something that doesn't really need a lot of words like I'm probably doing now. Um, but I, um, I've i just learned to, you know, to kind of keep things, keep things concise. And I have a picture I keep meaning to send to my editor of my previous manuscripts the first one was this massive thing that was just obnoxious and they've slowly slimmed down over time and I even just like yes I'm, I'm doing it I'm getting better <laughs> what a great way of like benchmarking your own progress I love that. yeah that's really cool yeah Leslie how about you what's your relationship with editing um well I have one beta reader she's the only person that I will trust her to give it to first um to get their opinion on it um, my editor has the patience of a saint. <laughs> um, I think she's learned that the fact that she tells me one thing three books ago, um, in the hope that I will remember it, that when she gets the next story that she can see that, no, I forgot that and the other things that she told me as well. So it's kind of constant start from the beginning again. Um, but she has been, um, my um, editor is Cindy Creesap, and there aren't enough words to say how, how brilliant she is. She she helps me write, and that's the one thing that I want to do more than anything, and she helps me get those stories out, and it's as much on her as it is on me. That's, yeah, wonderful, and a great credit to editors everywhere who are the, the unsung heroes in many cases, right? They're, their names aren't on the front page, but they do so much work. Um, Lee, how about you? You've had so many, so editors. many editors. What's your relationship like with editing? What's your relationship like with editing? That makes it sounds like they're, you know, they're dropping me right and left. No. Uh, but <clears throat> I, um, I've had the worst editors and the best editors. 
uh, and my early books embarrass me because I, I didn't have uh, I, I didn't I didn't have editors who were editors, but uh, probably starting with Catherine Forrest, I started to learn things um, and and have respect for editors. Um, and uh, as I told Shelley Thrasher, who was my editor for a while, I, I learned from each editor. I might learn one thing or a few things. Um, um, and then I want another challenge. And I have met my challenge. The first time Ruth Sternglanz edited a novel, um, she, she chopped off the first nine chapters. And <laughs> she, I knew right away, she was right. Okay, fine. <laughs> but uh, it was a little bit of a shock. <laughs> uh, but, but I learned from that. Yeah, uh, uh, Sam, you're talking about being more concise um, and and economical with words and even with scenes. And uh, I, I've learned so much from every one of them, even the early ones. Um, and, and I'm just really, really grateful. Um, as for better re beta readers, um, of course, my wife um, and uh, a close friend, uh, but I don't ask for a lot of feedback. I just ask them if something's off, and and that that's helpful because then I just go back and <laughs> chop off nine chapters. <laughs> I love that. It it is always hard to lose words, but sometimes you have to. In fact, a lot of times you have to. And uh, and you know you go through some mourning, but then mourning, but then. Yeah, I, I, ha I had to learn that my words are not safe. Mm, mm, true, and, and that is a hard lesson. So we are almost approaching time. We've got about one minute left in our panel. And I just, I'm so grateful for all of you. Would you mind offering some advice to one final question, which is um, what happens when you hit a stumbling block? Is there any quick advice you have for people who are suffering from writer's block or who are going through a really rough time? And any, any last, last thoughts on that one? Leslie, what do you do? Don't do something else and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you're just gonna keep building up bricks in that wall to stop you from getting any further. So go and wander off, play a game, read a book, then come back. Yeah. The important part is to come back, right? You, you wander off, but you have to come back. Sam, what about you? Yeah, I agree, doing something different. I like to go for walks when I'm struggling with something to write. Just kind of the movement starts my mind going again. So just doing something different. Love it, thanks. Morgan? I don't know if I'm the best one to give advice. This is my problem of always hitting a writer's block and getting distracted. Um, but usually what I do, I start reading a book because then I get the juices flowing and which is why I start so many books and I, then I never finish them. Um, but now that I'm wrapping up this one story, I think I can finally finish all those books. But yeah, reading other works helps, helps me. Excellent. Lee, any advice? Oh, Lee might be frozen on us a little bit. So we're gonna, we're gonna move to Georgia. Any advice on writer's block? Yes, remember who's in charge. It's you. So go take a walk, do what you gotta do, but come back to it because you are the boss and make those characters talk to you. Don't wait for the muse, make those characters talk. You're the boss. Well, that is a great piece of advice to send us off. So thank you so much, everyone. So Leslie and Lee and Morgan and Sam and Georgia, thank you. Thank you to Bold Strokes Books for hosting this. Thank you, audience. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Please take advantage of that great sale and have a wonderful day, everyone. Stay safe. Thank Bye. -bye. You. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,